Three things really touched me today. That the brotherhood of Islam never fails. Never fails, subhanAllah. That even when a Muslim, for some reason, takes the life of another, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still refers to him as your brother, subhanAllah. The second lesson that I learned, something which is very, very important. And this simply reemphasizes that Islam is a religion of balance. That a brother never takes advantage of the other brother. The two shuyukh gave an example of a Rahman bin Auf, where the brother Ansar offered his wealth offered his wife but look at the words may Allah bless you in your mal, in your family and in your wives if you were to maintain this balance we would have no problems in a brotherhood and sisterhood third that a brother sacrifices for the other brother and lastly more important is that this brotherhood lasts forever, even in the hereafter. That's what I'm carrying home with. And inshallah, may Allah continue to make this ummah stronger. And may this brotherhood illuminate from us. I just want to remind myself and quite a number of you of a clip that I saw of a da'i. We talk of the Sahabi, the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And maybe quite a number of us have seen this clip where a brother has reverted and is active in da'wah because of an act of a Muslim family. I don't remember which country it is, but this gentleman and his wife got lost. They didn't find their way back to the hotel. And they met a family in a village. It became dark. A Muslim family, yet there were non-Muslims. And this was a poor family. They were invited for supper. And when the time came for them to sleep, the family excused itself and said, you stay here, we are going to sleep there. It was dark. So they thought that the house has been left for them, they were going to sleep in another house. When they woke up, they saw this family with a grandmother crowding together under a tree, cold. This is contemporary. And this touched the gentleman and his wife and tears started rolling down their eyes. This family left their home went and decided to sleep under a tree together in the cold because of them. And they asked them why. And they said, you are our guests and we are Muslims. Subhanallah. And that became the reason why this man decided to study Islam and he became a Muslim and the wife became a Muslim and now they are actively doing da'wah for Islam. Subhanallah. So to some extent, we can relieve those examples of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I am Muslim, remember that. I am Muslim, a brother to another Muslim, but you are still a Muslim, even when it comes to non-Muslims. Shukran. Now it is my humble duty and pleasure to introduce to you Sheikh Asim al-Hakim who will come and touch on a matter that to many always look at it negatively. And this is chastity, modesty, and hijab. Sheikh Asim Al-Hakim is a Saudi national born in the city of Al-Khobar and currently resides in Jeddah. 
He got his BA in linguistics from King Abdulaziz University in Jidda in 1987. And later on, he had a higher diploma in Islamic studies from Ummul Qura University in Mecca in 1998. Shah is not strange to us. He's active in delivering Islamic programs for the media both in Arabic and English languages. He appears regularly on Al Huda TV, Peace TV and Iqra and is also very active on social media. Alhamdulillah he was involved in the early setup of Huda TV and he was the first Sheikh to appear in Ask Huda. Sheikh Salida Fadl. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The topic as you have heard is a little bit confusing because each word in the title requires a lecture and I won't be exaggerating if I say it requires a crash course. Nevertheless, we will focus on something that is a little bit relevant to us as Muslims. The Prophet said alayhi salatu was salam, in an authentic hadith every religion has moral conduct or ethics or manners and the moral conduct of Islam is bashfulness is al-haya some translated as shyness so bashfulness is the prominent characteristic of a Muslim specifically a Muslim woman and this is what the lecture would be focusing on last year I was fortunate to be invited here may Allah be pleased with uh, uh, those who invited me and thought well of me and I had a request and that was why have the sisters in front of the speaker now, part of our modesty and bashfulness is that we do not look at women. So when you put them in front of me, what do you want me to do? Make my rest of the lecture like this? Yeah, I, need, I hope the organizers think of something. At least, I don't know. It's not my job to design. But you guys have to do something about it. So the sisters might be offended. Who cares? I was in Malaysia last week and I had a lecture in a university and after a, my lecture a sister from the faculty of the Islamic University came to ask me a question so while she was asking me I was looking at the ground and I answered her question and left the following day a remark comes to me from a brother who's a colleague to her and he says that she is furious why why doesn't he look at me in the eyes subhanallah she's a hijabi hello you're a muslima what are you talking about so some of the sisters may be offended who cares the most important thing is that you have it in you and that you display the characteristic of a real muslim and this is the problem we have. The issue of bashfulness, al-haya. It is part of our manners. It is a moral conduct that is honorable, that calls you to refrain from doing anything that is bad for your reputation, that is sinful, that is haram, and instructs you to do everything that Allah has instructed you to do plus to do whatever brings praise to you as an individual 
bashfulness is also one of Allah's beautiful attributes. But we know and acknowledge that Allah's attributes are not like ours. It goes without saying. So when you say Allah Azza wa Jal is all seeing, Allah has sight. Is Allah's sight like ours? Definitely not. Is Allah's hearing like ours? Definitely not. Allah's hearing and sight can detect the footsteps of an ant in the midst of the night on a clear stone, which no one can see or hear except Him Azza wa Jal. And likewise, Allah Azza wa Jal is described as being bashful. And this type of bashfulness is different than ours because when a servant of Allah Azza wa Jal sins, when he makes a sin, Allah is capable of exposing him, of tormenting him on the spot. Yet Allah's great generosity, perfect tolerance, and Allah's perfection prevents him from exposing him. How many of us have sins? All of us. And no one can claim that we are sinless. If sin had a fragrance or an odor, no one could sit next to us. But Allah Azza wa Jal is concealing our sins, though He can expose us. And, then, and on the Day of Judgment, Allah's bashfulness may and may not forgive these sins that He concealed on earth. Also, bashfulness is a characteristic of prophets. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, may Allah be pleased with him, says that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was more shy than a virgin in her seclusion. So the Prophet himself, alayhi salatu wasallam, the leader, was shy, was bashful, would not come and say words we use in our everyday communication. A servant of Allah like us is also bashful of the angels who are with you 24-7, who know what you do and record every move you take and every thought you think of and every word you speak of. They record it. So a servant of Allah is bashful, is shy. A true servant of Allah who has knowledge. If he wants to do something and then says, the angels are watching. The angels will record. The angels will testify on the day of judgment. Also, we are bashful and shy of those who are around us. So we, are, as, as children, are bashful from our parents. We, as individuals, are bashful from our spouses. We, as individuals are bashful from our colleagues, our relatives, our neighbors. We refrain so many times of doing something that may backfire on us because it is immodest, because it does not fit the criteria of al-haya. And the best of these things on the human level is when you become bashful and shy of your own self. When you don't care about people, this is the best. Because even if you are alone in your room, behind closed doors, you may lie and fool people, but you know deep down inside that you cannot fool yourself. You cannot lie to yourself. And this gives you sleepless nights. A person with such bashfulness, he may fool, he may cheat, he may say things that are not true, but whenever he goes to bed, he cannot go to sleep. His conscience is killing him because he's shy of himself. How can I do such a thing? How was it possible for me to say or act in this fashion? This is a sign of Iman. And whenever someone does not have this in him, he will sleep like a baby. 
but he will be sinful from the top of the, his head to his toes. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the people learnt from the previous times of prophethood that if you do not feel shy, act as you wish. And this is a warning and not a permission, which highlights the role of shyness. Being shy, being bashful, this prevents you from falling into sin. And it is part of Iman. And this is why the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, wal hayau min al iman. Bashfulness is part of faith. It is one of the branches of faith. Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, may Allah have mercy on his soul, great scholar of Islam, divides bashfulness into two types. One, a type that is genetic that is inherent, that Allah created you with it. And this is found in the Kafir and the Muslim, in the disbelievers and in the believers. This type, which it becomes a characteristic of a person that he dis did not acquire, Allah built it in him. This fits in the Hadith. Where the Prophet said, bashfulness brings only goodness, regardless where it is implemented or by whom. This type of haya, of bashfulness, is the one that prevents people from doing shameful acts. Even in Kafir countries, you go. They're all kafir, they're disbelievers, but in some specimens, in some categories, you would find them bashful, unwilling to lie, unwilling to commit something that is immodest. Though their religion does not prevent them from doing it, the norms do not prevent them from doing it, but it is the inherent, something that Allah instilled in them. And this is something which is a favor and a blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal. Because Allah gives it to you without you working hard for it. Umar ibn Khattab says, may Allah be pleased with him. Whoever is shy and bashful, he will hide. Meaning he will not commit sins in public. And whoever hides, then this means that he will be Protective, meaning even in, in when he conceals his sin, his sins will not be as public or as large as when doing it in public. And whoever is protective, Allah Azza wa Jal will protect him. And all of this coming from what? From being bashful. The second type, according to Abu Raj, uh, uh, Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, the second type of bashfulness is the one that you work to get it. It's not inherent. You have to work hard to attain it. And this can come only from knowing Allah Azza wa Jal, from acknowledging His beautiful names and attribution, from getting closer to Allah Azza wa Jal through good deeds. Once you do this, once you acknowledge that Allah Azza wa Jal knows what is secret, and knows your gaze where it goes when it looks at something unlawful once you do this you feel this gained type of bashfulness and this is the highest level of perfection or of ihsan a muslim can attain now this was an introduction to the topic of modesty and bashfulness. What is the theme of this conference? Because every conference has to have a theme. At the end of the day, you want to go home and say, I've benefited something. What? I have no idea. 
So many long talks, beautiful international orators coming and displaying beautiful English, and the man just waves his hands as if he's in a, a, a concert or whatever. I don't know, I'm just watching. Is he doing sign language? I don't know. But beautiful. But what was it about? I have no idea. There's no benefit. You have to go back home and say, listen, I've learned this, and this is what I'm going to implement. What is the theme of the conference? Jumbo Jumbo. What is the theme of the conference? I am a Muslim. So, Akhi, when you say I'm a Muslim, this has a lot of consequences that must follow. It's not a, something that you I'm a Muslim, so what? But I drink, I party all night long, I deal with riba, I do this and that. You're not a Muslim. You may look like a Muslim. Your name is Muhammad Ahmed Hamid. Your name is sounds like a Muslim, but when I see you behave, you're not a Muslim. I am a Muslim means that I have an identity. And this is what this conference is all about. It's supposed to be. I hope the brothers will talk about the same topic and that we are in sync. But I don't, uh, who cares? I care about my lecture. So we have to look at our identity. If you see me in Siberia, or in the jungles of Africa, or in America, would you know that I am a Muslim? I don't wear this anywhere except when I give my khutbah. Usually I'm with jeans and t-shirts. But would you recognize me as a Muslim? Maybe. How would you know that? By the way I look, this is important, and by the way I behave, because even the Sikhs have longer beard. Fidel Castro had a longer beard, but a big cigar, so you can tell, mm, he's not a Muslim. So is it the beard? Is it the, the maxi I'm wearing? Huh? It, wh what is it? So it has to be a combination of 360, inside out. Our topic is the identity of a Muslim woman. And the sisters are lowering their heads. Here we go again. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Don't jump to conclusion. My lectures are original. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> so let us first begin with the identity of a Muslim woman. The identity of Muslim woman was the target of attack since the first lady not Melina, definitely. I'm talking about the real first lady. Who's that? Hawa, peace be upon her. Imagine the attack on her identity was since she was created. A'udhu Billah. Listen to this ayah. But Satan whispered to them to make apparent to them that which was concealed from them of their private parts. So he plotted since day one against Hawa, against Eve's identity to expose her. Akhi, there was only Adam, so what's the big deal? Oh, it's gonna come in later generations. And Allah gave us this warning by reminding us of the example where Allah says, O children of Adam, let not Satan tempt you as he removed your parents from paradise, stripping them of their clothing to show them their private parts. So the plotting began since day one, and it continues. And you can see this clearly if you open in Arabic, we say, if you turn on, sorry, the television set, if you go to the market, if you walk in the street, if you tour the malls, you find that the common de de denominator worldwide is nudity, shamelessness, and immodesty. To all those who are controlled, by shaitan, by Satan. 
whether they are in the primitive tribes of Africa or the Amazon, it's nudity. Or it is on the catwalks in Milano, Paris, or New York. The same concept of exposing their awrah, of stripping them of their modesty. It's the same thing, but they call this one civilization, and they call this tribalism and primitive uh, uh, people of the jungle. Bashfulness is what adorns a righteous woman. It goes side by side. And a lot of the scholars, imams of the masjid, the da'is, the righteous men, and the righteous women complain. So all the good guys complain of what the bad guys are doing. The ugly are watching, unfortunately. So they are complaining of what? They're complaining that modesty and bashfulness has been taken out from the people's character. And if the enemy of Islam succeeds in stripping Muslim women from their bashfulness, they have succeeded. They would succeed in destroying the Muslim Ummah. Because you can spoil a man and his spoilment, if that was a, a true noun, I don't know, who cares? If that is true, it's upon himself. But when you spoil a woman, she drags behind her a thousand men with a smile. She corrupts a whole family, children and in-laws, etc. One woman is more devastating to the ummah than a thousand cannons. And the old invaders, the old, I don't know if it's, it's the right word, of, I'm an Arab, so take my English and throw it in the garbage. The, the colonist people who came and try to rule the Muslim country, they said, a beautiful woman and a glass of wine corrupts the Muslim ummah more than a thousand armies. It corrupts men. Men are, you know, their brain is this big. With all due respect, alhamdulillah. Our, our, our brains are so small when it comes to women, when it comes to desires. This is human nature. This is what drives men. So by focusing on women, they would manage to destroy the Muslim Ummah. In this topic, this is still an introduction, huh? So it's going to be a long day. We will not talk about hijab and the conditions and the niqab and the issue of dispute among scholars. You've heard this a gazillion time. Google the word gazillion, you'll find so many zeros. You have heard this, you don't need to talk about this, but we have to analyze how women look nowadays in an Islamic perspective, not analyze you. No, this is not what I meant. Analyze in the sense, does it fit the Quran and the Sunnah? Does it please Allah Azza wa Jal? If you look, we find that women's hijab does not fit the criteria of Islam. A lot of the women wear hijab in a modern way. We have modern Islam. This is prevailing now in the media. We don't have extreme Islam. We don't have fanatic Islam. We have modern Islam, quote unquote. What do you mean by modern Islam? Is, is it the same that the Prophet brought? I said, no, 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 it's different. It's different. It's a new version. It's 3.1. Masha Allah, tabarakallah. I guarantee you that this is filled with viruses. And it will destroy your CPU. It will destroy your hard disk. It will destroy everything in your house. Anything that goes against or out of the boundaries of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is total destruction and bound to fail. But what kind of modern Islam are you talking about? You find a sister covering her hair and wearing tight jeans or skinny. Excuse me. I said, what? I'm a hijabi. Uh-huh. <laughs> MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Hijabi? What kind of hijab are we talking about? 
there seems to be difficulty in understanding. You find them wearing sleeves that are so tight, if they don't wear it, they would so show all the scars in their bodies. It's best to show these scars rather than showing that they are, mashallah, beautiful, etc. They wear tight abayas that can you, you can tell the measurements if you have a good eye, <laughs> which is not advisable. It is not according to Islam. This is something new. And it's totally against modesty and bashfulness. Even between women and women, I get my wife, my daughters coming to me and complaining. Why? They went to a wedding and they come after half an hour back. Why didn't you stay and enjoy your time and eat? I said, if you saw, and I said, I wish I could see. I said, and bang, oh. <laughs> I was joking, I was joking. My wife has a very hard, hard, uh, any, hard temper. She doesn't take a good joke. Anyhow, <laughs> and they say, if you see what we saw, you'll be shocked. Women are wearing revealing clothes. Some of them, you know, tight, some of them see-through, some of them short. And this is not in a kafir country, this is in a Muslim wedding. And they say, Islamic wedding. <laughs> Excuse me, what kind of Islamic wedding? Say, there's no music. <laughs> Mashallah, there's no music, but there's nudity. <laughs> what are you doing? So they have a problem between women and women themselves. And nowadays, Sincerely speaking, I believe that men are more bashful and shy than women. Wallahi, sometimes sisters come to me and speak to me, I feel and shy. I feel shy, and I am not a shy person. I, feel, I was in a, in a Muslim country, I gave a lecture, Islamic lecture, you know, full of motivation, Quran and Sunnah. When I went out, two sisters came to me. So, Assalamu Alaikum. So, lower my gaze as usual, you know, fear of my wife watching me. Yes, Alaikum Assalam. And one of them said, Sheikh, can we take a selfie? And I said, Were you in the lecture? I said, Yes, beautiful lecture. What did you hear? What was I preaching? Rated R material? What, what, what is this? And the sister felt embarrassed, not shy, not bashful felt embarrassed because of my question was a bit shocking. She said, no, 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 Sheikh, you got us wrong. It's two of us with you, not one. Masha Allah, look at the fiqh. She doesn't want khulwa. So both of them, men are more bashful than women nowadays. You get women calling for women empowerment. They ask for equality. They want to have women rights. And I ask, are these rights within the boundaries of Islam that Islam guaranteed for women or something extra? So no, no, there's something extra. Then you want a new religion. You don't want Islam. You want your rights in Islam, go to scholars. They'll define your rights from the Quran and the Sunnah. What you want is something more. We want equality, Shaykh. Equality of what? Allah says, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَى Males are not like females. Yeah, but we want equality. Like what? Yani I get pregnant this year and you get pregnant next year. What kind of equality do you want? There is no equality in Islam. There is fairness. There is justice. And each has a role. And this is the misconception that they are throwing at us through the media and the Muslims are swallowing it like medication without knowing that it is poison. So the identity of you, sister, begins with your shyness and bashfulness. If you lose shyness and bashfulness, you lose your identity. Wear your hijab as much as you want. It would not have any impact. Look, look at the way a sister deals with a co-worker. Some offices, women work. I will not come to the ruling, is it halal or haram? But I ask you by Allah, is what's happening in our offices and companies and banks Something Islamic? Muhammad, I'm going to get a bite. Would you like some sandwiches? <laughs> Muhammad says, <laughs> I cannot answer it here, so maybe, inshallah. There is an answer, it's boom. 
But is this normal? What are you doing? Sheikh, he's my colleague. I work with him eight hours. I sit with him more than I sit with my father. What about the Son and the Holy Ghost? <laughs> what are you doing? This has nothing to do with Islam. You are drifting away, but you convince yourself that you're a Muslim and that you have your identity. You do not have an identity, sister. How much time do I have? <laughs> 10 minutes. You gotta be joking. I'm just in the, into the introduction, wallahi. Okay, L let us move a little bit faster, but I don't promise to honor the time. Bashfulness in Islam towards, see, females have different stages. Their awrah, the way they deal with bashfulness and modesty differs when they're infants and when they're toddlers when they're about 10 or 11 years of age, when they reach the age of puberty, and they, when they pass the 60 or 70 marker of age. It's different stages. We won't have time to go through this, but Islam focuses on training and conditioning boys and girls to be shy and modest from an early age, each in its own perspective. Islam looks high at a woman's shyness and bashfulness to the extent that it instructs women to cover and wearing the hijab women ask the frequently asked question why don't men wear the hijab it seems valid question but it is not if you have 20 women and you get the most handsome man in the world to come in between two or three would look the rest would Eh, not my type. But if you get 20 men and get one bombshell huh, in there, all of them, even the mutawwa, hur al wow. It may be one or two, may Allah make us among those who would lower the gaze. But this is inevitable, this is human nature. That's why women have to be wearing the hijab and men who go out and work are ordered while women are wearing the hijab to lower their gaze. So it's not that she's wearing the hijab, Sheikh, I can talk to her, I can smile, I can crack jokes, I can have a good time. She's a stranger to you. She's an unmahram and you have to lower your gaze. Islam protects women by preserving their modesty to the extent and this is what the liberals in our Muslim community always brag about. And the Kafir in their civilized, modern countries talk about freedom. Women have freedom. There is no freedom greater than the freedom of Islam to women. To the extent that if a single person slanders a woman, and accuses her of adultery or of immodesty, he is immediately instructed to provide four witnesses that she committed fornication or adultery. If he fails, we flog him 80 lashes in his back. For what? I just said that she looks like a prostitute. What, what did they do? Khalas, ta'al, habibi. We will take care of you. We will cleanse you. This is how Islam treats women. Islam protects women's chastity and modesty to the extent that even shaking hands, which I've seen a lot here. Of course, in where I come from, it is widely spreading with a new trend, unfortunately. But this is apparent in all Muslim countries. I see women, hijabi women, coming in, assalamu alaikum, and shaking hands with non-mahram men, and the man is, wa alaikum as -salam. If I can go further, I would, but sorry, I can't. What is this? Islam prohibits this. Islam tells us that it is best for a man to be stabbed in his head with a needle of steel rather than touch a woman that is not permissible for him. So imagine, my sister, how Islam protects you and your modesty. Islam prevents mixing with the mahram. 
Now, uh, let me rephrase that. Erase this from, edit it, huh? Let me re rephrase that. Islam prohibits women from mixing with non-mahram relatives. Your relative who is a non-mahram, how is that? The Prophet ﷺ said, beware of entering upon women, addressing the men. So one of the men stood up and said, oh, Prophet of Allah, what do you think about the brother-in-law, my brother? What's wrong in him entering upon my wife, mixing with her? We live in a joint family, Sheikh. So the Prophet ﷺ said, the brother-in-law is death. If you allow your brother to mix with your wife, then this is inevitable death. It's like allowing death to come. A lot of the husbands say, okay, let death come. You can get a second wife. Well, you can get a second wife with your wife at the moment, so no problem for her to not to die, inshallah. So Islam protects a woman from mixing with non-mahram relatives, brothers-in-law, the uncle of the husband, the cousin of the husband. It is prohibited. Then what is the ruling on mixing with co-workers? Someone who's a total stranger, with a driver, with anyone that is not a mahram and that is not related to you. Islam protects the chastity and bashfulness of a woman. To the extent that Islam prevents women from leaving their homes wearing perfumes. Nina Ricci, Gucci, Chanel, number five. You name it, the list is long. I have 13 girls of my own, so don't say, oh, Sheikh, how do you know? I know. I know things about girls more than I know things about men. I haven't been with. At the moment I feel like growing a uterus after this long. Anyhow, this is beside the point. When you come to wearing perfume, even to the masjid, it's haram. Abu Hurairah was on the streets, met a woman, and he was like slapped by the amount of perfume she's wearing. And she said, oh, servant of the Lord, the mighty Allah, are you going to the masjid? She said, yes. He said to her, go back to your home and have a total ritual bath. Because I've heard the Prophet said, any woman goes out of her home to the masjid wearing perfume, Allah will not accept her prayer until she has a ritual bath. And our sisters are coming and wearing perfumes. What are you doing? And they don't wear these same perfumes for their husbands. No, 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 this is for going out. Yours is this uh, root, this uh, something is five, five shillings I bought. The expensive one is only for going out. This is wrong. Allah Azza wa Jal prevented women from exposing things that are even hidden. Allah says in the Quran, and let them not stamp their feet to make known what they conceal of their adornment. Meaning if a woman, and a lot of the women do, wear anklets. It's very fine, it's very nice, but to your mahram, to your husband, to your brother, not to the, ex and some of it has bells in it, like horses, you know, when horses walk and you hear these bells, some of the sisters do this and they walk and they make this sound. Even a man, when he's blind, he says, oh, wow, this, she has to be a knockout. Because of the sound, this is how shaitan works. Islam tells her when she speaks, she must not speak like a man. Because this would prevent her from entering, hell, uh, entering paradise. But at the same time, she must not soften her voice. And this is a problem that a lot of the women do not pay attention to. They even talk to a shopkeeper. Please, come on, how much are you going to make this for me? Come on, give me a discount, please. And the guy says, I'll give you what you want, my, my, my uh, customer, <laughs> whatever. This is problematic, even on the phone. They have, they soften their voices. Allah says, if you fear Allah, then do not be soft in speech to men, lest he in whose heart is disease should desire or covet, but speak with appropriate speech. Now, all of this is just a sample of how Islam promotes bashfulness and shyness in women.
Do we have this in our women? Inshallah, we do. But maybe we lack points here or there that we have to work with them together to, to try and uh, um, promote it. If you succeed, you will be a bashful, shy woman. And if you look at our righteous predecessors, our Salaf, a woman who used to have episodes of seizure, it's something to do with the electricity in the brain, and she loses conscience, she falls on the floor, and she shakes and foam comes from her mouth. She came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Oh Prophet of Allah, pray to Allah that he cures me. The Prophet gave her an option, one of two. If you wish, I'll pray for you. And if you wish, you're patient, and Allah will reward you Jannah with that. So the woman saw, mm, no, definitely I want Jannah. She, she said, I will be patient, O Prophet of Allah. But when I get these seizures, I fall down unconscious and I am revealed. My aura is exposed. You know, when someone falls unconscious, he doesn't know what's happening to him. So pray to Allah for me not to be exposed. And the Prophet did, alayhi salatu wasalam. Look what the woman is thinking of, not to be exposed. And look what some of our, our women are doing at the moment. Spending so much time in front of the mirror before going out. You are going out. You are not allowed to put any kind of makeup on your face if you believe that the face is not aura. You are not allowed. Say, Sheikh, but I have some pimples here. I'd like to cover. Well, cover it for whom? Why do you want to cover it? So, uh, I don't know. Maybe somebody is going to look. Subhanallah. It is haram for you to do this. So there are one minute, alhamdulillah. So a sister says, how can we increase our bashfulness and shyness? I have like seven, eight points. Each point requires six to seven minutes. So this is a good 42 minutes. I don't think the moderator, he's mashallah bigger than me will allow me to do this and I'm, yani, I have another lecture tomorrow. So quickly, first of all, you have to increase your Iman, your belief in Allah Azza wa Jal, because it goes side by side. The more belief you have, the more bashfulness and shyness. This is for both men and women. The Prophet ﷺ passed by two men. One of them was scolding his brother, telling him, why are you so shy? Why aren't you? upfront, you know, loud and demanding, etc. And the guy is bashful and shy, is, is quiet. So the Prophet told him, leave him because bashfulness is from Iman. So he's not doing something wrong, you're doing something wrong, leave him. And secondly, what increases your bashfulness is to recall Allah's favors and blessings upon you. Whenever you want to do something bad, whenever you want to do something haram, whenever you want to skip a salah, whenever you want to skip an obligation, you remember Allah's favors and blessing upon you. And once you do, you are fearful that Allah will take it out, take it away, take it from you. So you become bashful from Allah Azza wa Jal and do what you should do. Al Junaid, may Allah have mercy on his soul, said, bashfulness is acknowledging Allah's favors and blessing and confessing of your own shortcomings. And from these two phases, bashfulness is created. Number three, one of the beautiful reasons for you to become bashful and shy is to acknowledge that there are people watching you. So whenever you want to do something, Remember that there are people watching you. Of course, Allah is watching over you, but sometimes we're neglectful. We see only those who see us in the sense that the Prophet ﷺ was approached by one of his companions and he said to him, O Prophet of Allah, give me an advice. So the Prophet said ﷺ, I advise you to be bashful of Allah as if you are bashful from a righteous man when looking at you. If you are in a mall 
and you see someone and you'd like to talk to this someone from the opposite gender and get to know one another and maybe, you know, flirt for a while, would you do this if Sheikh Saeed Raji is overlooking you? And he's, mashallah, tall, so he can have a helicopter view. Would you do that? He said, no, Sheikh is watching. Let the Sheikh go. The Prophet is telling us this. Be bashful of Allah as if someone that you know as righteous is watching you. How would you react? I would definitely be modest and be shy. Number, whatever. Uh, uh, take a role model. Who's your role model? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we know that he was more bashful than a woman in her, or a virgin in her seclusion. Also, Allah Azza wa Jal gave us an example in the Quran when Musa fled Egypt and he came to two women who were watering their sheep but were hesitant to do so because they are unable to mix with men. And this shows you how bashful they were long ago. So he watered for them and then went to the shade of the tree asking Allah Azza wa Jal to, to give him and to provide for him and expressing his poverty. Immediately on the spot, Allah Azza wa Jal gave him his answer. A woman, Allah says, then one of the two women came to him walking with shyness. So this is your role model. She came walking in shyness saying, indeed, my father invites you that he may reward you for having watered for us. If my father was well, he would have watered. If he was capable, he would have come and invited you. But he has no one except me and my sister. So I'm coming in bashfulness and shy and requesting that you come. This is how a woman should be. Not what we hear sometimes when the sisters even in Islamic conferences, I go and some of the sisters who are organizing, they speak loudly, more louder than the men. And they laugh loudly, more louder than the men. This is not part of modesty. A sister should be concealed. She does whatever she wants with the other sisters, laugh and talk and have fun, but not in front of the men. Remembering the grave, the hereafter, the resurrection, the sirat, these things of the unseen that we will pay for our deeds and for our actions and for what we say on these events. When you remember this, men and women will be modest, will be bashful because they remember that they will have to pay for whatever they do. And studying Allah's beautiful names and attributes. We have great deficiency in knowing Allah's beautiful names and attributes. If someone gives us an A4 paper, tells us to write whatever we know from Allah's beautiful names and attributes, we may not succeed in exceeding five lines. And if someone asks us to explain these names that we have written, we would fail to do that with five to 10 and finally, before someone comes, um, you have to exert the effort. You have to do your level best to fight your own, your own soul, your inner self, because Satan is messing with your mind. He's the one who's encouraging you to sin. He's the one who's encouraging you to be immodest and to be like everyone else. Why me? Everyone else is not shy or not bashful or not modest. So might as well be with the crowd. Even if the crowd goes to hell, shaitan tells you dying with the majority is a blessing and a mercy from Allah. And this is not wrong, that this is not correct. The prophet said alayhi salatu was salam, bashfulness and iman, they are combined and joined together. If one of them is uplifted, the other one is taken away. هذا والله أعلم ونسبة العلم إليه أسلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين